I'm going to read you some poems uh, from the leads. I'm going to talk a little bit about the process as I went through writing the book. And I'll probably talk a little bit and read a little bit. And uh, generally, the poems that I read to you are kind of standard for what I was writing at the time. Um, I was the first thing that I was writing. It actually switched a couple of poems up based on you know, the talks that we just heard because I thought they would be relevant. So uh, I will uh, I'll start and I'll just I'll give you a couple of things from the book. And uh, you know, some poets I don't like to do this, but I like to describe a little bit about what's going to happen to his projects. Uh, so I worked in Southern Alberta in Saskatchewan, and the first time that I was going to Saskatchewan, they said that. Uh, yeah, we're going to send you to Saskatchewan. Uh, there's, there's enough work there. You're going to stay at the ranch. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. Normally I stay in hotels. That sounds great. And uh, we drove for about eight hours, and this one was called the ranch. You sleep on stacked mattresses and mice run the floor, biting at toes. You wake, set traps, and stack the mattresses higher still. This is old Sask summer. Blacks and mustard paint the horizon with the bright yellow color of the sun you find in children's pictures. And always the sky is just another dead prairie above you. Everything you remember lives inside the chicken farm homestead with its back broken frame and that reef of old water sitting still. At night, the house breathes with open windows, swells at the seams. At sunrise, it exhales the dust so fine you think of bullhearts dry on the ground. When it's gutted with furniture, you find imprints in the carpet. Four beds, two dressers, a shelf. And from those years when no one kept it, from before the oil and the oil came, the mark where the deer walked in, lay down and died. Fenceless. There are no signposts, no old man waiting to tell you here. This place repeats itself. Everywhere you've been is folded in grass and dirt. You blame chance, not science, for putting the iron here. Like no seismic charts were read, no holes drilled. It's a wealthy man and God just wanted you sweating in the mud. But the cows, they can find borders even under daylight sterile sun. Watch nations grow from blueprints. Divide the plain by men and else. They graze away, uncountable. Unheard as you walk the field, tool to tool, with no sense of what's yours and what's not. At midnight, under the shelter of the flare, everything is smaller. The wolf flits in firelight, cows gather in the darkness on the edge of the site, scratching thighs against steel tankers. Gut sounds and groans fill the beast like braille. Coyote yells and looking for each other in the stark of your sight. The flow and whistle of the wild quiets in the world flare. To shrink. You feel your stomach tighten. A dirty man at a tongue of fire, wrapped in leather, chewing meat, a thousand years ago. So, I was working uh, in Southern Oregon in Saskatchewan in the summer year of my undergrad, thinking for a year or two following high school. And I went straight from uh, kind of doing this work <coughs> to uh, Moving to Toronto and uh, starting an MFA, and I walked into a room full of poets, and I was kind of uh, still very much in the flow of the book. And I hadn't really planned on writing anything about the book or that work. Really, uh, I don't want to write just about anything else because generally I felt like I was putting in time. Uh, it wasn't something that I particularly wanted to be doing. But as I started writing poems, the book was just seeing. And it got to a point where the, the joke would kind of be that it was, you know, I was contaminated in some way. That whatever I wanted to do, this oil was going to get off, I could get rid of it, eventually go on and do it. Um, and as I started writing these poems and saying that, I was noticing that people, for some reason, were, were really interested. Uh, and, you know, outside of, you know, whether the poems were quality or anything else, I don't know if I tried to write and uh, as we try
trying to figure out why exactly people were, were interested, one of the things that I sent down on was this sense of, of authority. Um, and people were just believing whatever I told them about the OF, uh, whatever I told them. And I started to wonder where, where exactly this authority is coming from. And one of those things was naturally just, you know, history of experience. One of the other things was that for the most part, there was some Canadian poetry I was walking into an empty space. And there hadn't really been anybody writing about this particular scene. Um, and there really wasn't a whole lot of, you know, what they would call word poetry in the first place, at least not in Canada. And personally, I hadn't been framed in that way at all. In my mind, I was writing, you know, kind of confessional poems that took place in the oil field. And that's how I expected things to be interpreted. As people started, you know, writing about the book and doing reviews and everything, um, you know, the more prominent the review, the more I lost control of what kind of poem that I had supposed to be written. So I just wanted to come to accept that I was writing for a book here, I guess. So those were some of the places where, where that authority was coming from. As I sort of queried these, I, I found you know, a few more. One of them was that I had just come from the oil field and showed up in this room full of poets. And my hobbies are like Thai boxing and things like that. And in a room full of poets, uh, I presented a very stereotypically masculine person, more so when I read the first life of oil field. In a room full of oil workers, not so much. <laughs> and so I just had this authority given to me over this, you know, very male-dominated realm. Uh, and and then I started to think basically about where that authority factored into the poems, um, what was happening. So I wanted to break down what was working, and what wasn't. You know, worked toward completing the book, like a series of poems. And I'll talk about it more in a little bit, but um, I'll stop and, and read a couple more poems here. Uh, and I think a couple of these might be uh, touching on some of the other stuff. Tank. Squats three days at a time, white brown mud that sticks and sucks like a mouth against everything it touches. The long battle, the bit by bit to urging steel to the center of the earth. You dream of sinking past the slow ride of oil, sand, and stone to the bottom of the prairie shield. Forget it. The pylons packed, the extinguisher strapped, the guy wires of the stack plucked, swing loose again against the sky. Everything ends briefly, and the iron world moves on. Only the tire ruts are left, six inches deep, wet with water and an oil machine, and even those are eaten over by wheat and flax and mustard seeds. No mark survives this place. You too will yield to a memory. Give everything you are in three-day pieces. Watch the gypsy iron move. Follow its commands. Tend the rusted steel like a shepherd. Uh, so, I've written a, I put a few different types of poems basically throughout the book, and I focused on a series of areas. One of them is just a general poem about experience or something like that. I did a few poems about very specific equipment, like I just read, and then I did another portrait poem to the people who I met. Uh, I'm going to be doing a little more general ones now and over the other people. This poem is basically about coming back from a job site one time and kind of seeing the smoke off in the distance all the way into town and, uh, and realizing very likely we were driving up toward oil that had happened at a well. And not really needing to go near it, but for some reason, us in the truck just ended up driving over to the well that was really strange where uh, the place where this was taking place was called. Sky. 
As a child, you painted your face this color. Ash from driftwood burnt on the beach. Jellyfish drifting upside down. Charging dead angles. The sand against your stings. A blowout. They both guess when I came back. King Cab and the suit driving. It's all sour, too. You hit a barricade at Columbia Road. Firemaster trucks everywhere. The campground evacuated. Too dead when the stabbing dog went. The pipes went so fast it took one guy's face clean off. But you only noticed later. On that day, you drive with your asses off the leather, so close to yourselves, toes curling after something solid, foothold inside your split toe boots. So I had planned on reading this next one, but then I got excited when I heard Piper Alpha in a not more good way. Uh, and so this one was called Remember Charlie, which is the name of the safety video. Uh, and basically, when we started a new company, you get set up with an old VCR uh, kind of back of the shop. You go through a day or so of clicking through new safety videos and, uh, and taking tests and things like that. Uh, remember Charlie was the only one who was a couple of other people as well. In the back room of the shop, you spend a day with Winnis and Piper Alpha in a videotape of Charlie, burned up. When someday you want to roll up the sleeves of your coveralls, let your bare wrists touch the breeze, risk the gas in the air, they want you to remember him. How he pulls his red sweater off his arms, and how you always see his pale skin is darker and redder than the yawning mouth of the dogs who terrorized your youth. The video finishes, the VCR gears click, the tape rewinds to the next guy, and you start guessing at appearance fees, video royalties. Later, you and the boys will bargain on skin percentage, trade burns or breaks, bulk sell your fingers for a better deal. You all figure you cook half your body, the lower half, for even million. When Joel's wife shows up for his paycheck a few weeks later, when you watch a half circle barrel edged and up of his wrist forget itself and grasp out of beer, you find yourself tuned to every clash of steel on steel. You see snakes and shedding skin in obstacle beds. You remember Charlie, and you begin to wait. So, we'll read one more and then I'll talk a little bit more about the process. This one is called Under Air, and it's basically about uh, working in a, on a job site with a lot of hydrogen sulfide, uh, which I, I'm guessing everybody has some sense of. It's just a poisonous mess. Uh, all men must be clean shaven. The small mustache is acceptable, but the rubber has the seal. Here, your pale boy face is a virtue. The men don't tongue you ten razors a month. You're lazy. You don't lift much, and you can barely hammer, but you can stay under air for hours. The steady in and out sound of oxygen rushing your face through its tubes, the urgency of gases, forever escaping itself. Even sour gas, heavier than air, hurries to the earth. Your soup watches you, 30 feet away, waiting for you to drop. And you think of how the gas can kill your lungs, your brain, but your ears, they're fine, your fingers, fine. And could it get into your coveralls and sneak up inside your ass, finish you that way? Incident report. Fatality. Worker dies from H2S against his contact. All employees must wear latex underwear. Bums must be clean shaven. A little hair is acceptable. The rubber has to seal. <laughs> Thank you. 
caught between two audiences. Uh, they want to be able to write the people in the place that I was writing about. I want them to not feel ill and to judge. I didn't want to move myself and jeopardize that authority. I also wanted to be able to write for my peers who, you know, were waking up and going to oil sands protests uh, as I'm writing all these oil poems. And I went back and forth with, you know, a number of genuinely selfish concerns as well, like I, I don't want to go out to the next book launch or try and find a publisher uh, while I'm the guy who was, you know, endorsing line poems that people read really terribly. And as I was looking at it, I kind of was wondering how do I describe the uglier stuff? You can't, uh, I can't write the poem about So this is, a, this is a poem called Stephen, but it's actually called Lawrence in reality. Loves his kids, hates their moms. Wears white beaters like someone slapped a paintbrush down his chest, left him stained, white striped and dirty. His belly seems swollen, reaches from a skinny frame, so that when he falls into a chair, he looks always like he's been feasting. All he eats are 7-Eleven frozens. He did and rushed to his mouth on plastic. He breaks the cardboard flat at the corners, licks it clean. Stephen will tell you he ran with gangs in Calgary and has some native in him, everyone from Saskatoon. His truck players pour blood. He brings you whiskey and a coffee pot to drink as he drives. Girl, 
was supposed to be Stevens. When after a few drinks, she starts kissing you, he tells you to fuck off and leaves, but comes back later while she's pissing and asks if you will share it. Just home for the summer, she's suspicious. Thinks the green bikini is your way of tricking girls into bed. After two months in this motel room, it's stranger to see someone touching her things than to feel her fingers curl against her shoulder on the left side, where the muscles tore when Lawrence dropped his end of the pipe. A ball player, hardball, national level. You wish she would believe you really just want to talk and kiss a little. And if she wants her body felt or if she wants to touch your dick, that's fine. But mostly, you just want to talk. She says her school is down in Texas, Christian too, but she goes there more for baseball than Jesus. They won't let boys inside her dorm, and maybe that's why she has to leave so fast when you take her hand in your palm and press them both against your crush. You wonder if you can get out before her, lock the door behind you and run home to her house, fall asleep in her bed. You will wait to bake and eggs, for family breakfast, or everyone mistakes you for Kelsey. You will cuddle with her sisters and over ten more and a half hard against their backs. Her father will kiss her forehead, call you darling, and help you practice pitching in the backyard. In the lifetime behind you, a girl paces the motel room, pulls strips of callus from her heels, sculpts her hands in the bathroom sink, sits with her back against the door before turning and shaking half her fingernails and knob, anything to try and wait for from her life. So we want more of the kind of rougher ones. What you do. At some point you will drip oil from your blood to the ground and think of how far this place is from real. You will watch men catch gophers, paint them red, and let them rip each other apart for fear of blood. You will call women wars, measure distance, and come here to encourage men to get him some cash. You're wondering if you're still Catholic enough to keep a sin. And if you sin, you're sharp enough to keep your spirit. James wants to tour Thailand. He's excited about the cheap sex, the freedom from condoms and lube, and a chance to make a woman he does not know, cannot know her lack of language, cry out from his roughness. Or at least that's what he says. Maybe he's just afraid that one of you would reach out and hold his head and press your forearm against the small of his back. Or maybe he's that rare man who's exactly what he says he is. When he talks, you please and pull away, or grow a little more like him for all your shutting up. As if he could leak into you with words, as if they held any power here. That's the end. Thanks. <laughs>